Can you guys hear me really well in the back? And can the video man hear me? Because now I only have to give this one more time ever in my life and it'll be recorded forever. I'll try to do a good job. My name is Carolyn Bohach and um, I am the only thing that stands between you and the end of doing this two-day session. So I hope I'm going to try really hard to, to offer you um, something that, that will be worth your while for the next 45 minutes. So I'm going to talk about methods that help cause learning. And um, as, I start, as I begin, um, I want everyone to take, I tried to get, this is very high quality University of Idaho toilet paper in these bags. I tried to actually get a roll, but you know it is impossible to take a roll of toilet paper out of the bathroom. But this is clean, so reach in there and I want you to, to take, just rip off a little bit of toilet paper as if you were going to use it. And uh, that's equal in the bags, but hopefully there'll be enough for everyone. You know, just take, take a piece of toilet paper. Okay, we're going to use it in a little bit. So um, I'm going to tell you about the courses that I've taught just briefly so that maybe you'll feel that I'm qualified to, to talk to you about uh, techniques that cause learning. So currently I teach introductory microbiology. It's a 100 level micro class for non-science majors, but microbiology majors also take it in their freshman year. And that course is a uh, very popular on campus. It has about 180 students enrolling every spring. In the past, um, I've taught immunology at 400 and 500 level, and um, I'm involved in undergraduate research in my laboratory, um, and I've done directed studies, and of course I teach graduate students, and I've taught biochemistry uh, at the medical school level in the WAMI program. The reason that I'm only teaching one class now is that part of my position at the University of Idaho now is also has some administrative duty. And I wrote a, a huge grant to the National Institutes of Health that funds the INBRI program. And INBRI stands for the Idea Network of Biomedical Research Excellence. And I have a little brochure about what this is. It builds capacity and gives opportunity to students and um, if you're doing biomedical research. So just to kind of advertise that just a tiny bit. So what is learning and, and what, what, are, what are we doing when we try to come into the classroom or into a laboratory and teach? You know, learning really is a very individual pursuit. And I think that our role, the teacher's role, is to inspire students to pursue a particular subject matter. We, I heard that in your previous presentation as well. So what are the methods that the best teachers are using? How, how can you hone this skill? And maybe this is the first time um, that, that you are going to be on the other side of the podium. And, um, and I hope that you'll all find that it's fun. Um, teaching is like making love. So this is a very personal thing. And what's appropriate when you, oh, is it OK if I walk up and down the steps? Ooh, he's going to follow me. This is very exciting, just like Hollywood. Um, so uh, you know, making love is a very personal thing. What's appropriate in, in some instances may not be appropriate in others. And it's very presumptuous for a person to tell you how to make love. Also very maybe presumptuous for someone to tell you how to teach. Um, and that phrase, teaching is like making love, I paraphrase from Dr. John Roth, who's at the University of Utah, a fabulous microbiologist and an exceptional teacher. So I'm going to share with you 17 of my teaching methods. Oh, and I guess I haven't told you how old I am, but you know, I'm old as the hills. I've been teaching since 1988, and, uh, you, and I TA'd before that. So, so I do have many years of experience, and these are 17 techniques that have, I think, worked for me. 
So we're going to go through them 1 through 17, another way that you're going to know when it's almost over. So the first thing is to be enthusiastic. There's nothing like bringing enthusiasm for your subject into the classroom. Now for some people, enthusiasm means that maybe you're like me, you know, and you're walking around and you're doing a lot of gesticulation. And when I talk about bacteria, just wait till you see how excited I'm going to get and how excited I'm going to get about that toilet paper. Um, but enthusiasm doesn't have to be that. If it is not your personality to be down on the stage making jokes and emoting the way that maybe I do, that's okay. You can be very quiet in your own personality and still bring the enthusiasm to your, of your subject into the classroom and the laboratory. So remember to be enthusiastic. The second point uh, that has done well for me is to expect excellence. The students will rise to the occasion. If you expect that they are reading every chapter and doing the problems at the end of every chapter or sitting and taking notes, and if you continually tell them that this is what you expect and you expect them to memorize the Krebs cycle and all the enzymes, if you expect that, they will rise to the occasion. So, so set the bar high because you will, you will get good participation and good learning from your students. They will learn the material. The third point uh, is to let the students do the work. It is not your job to come into the laboratory or into the lecture hall and spew out data or spew out information. This is not what a good teacher is. And, and although the students might be impressed that you have a lot of knowledge, it's boring for them. So don't just data dump. What you want, you want to expect that the students are going home and looking at the subject, either reading the text or doing problems. When you lecture or when you give TA presentations, what I think you're doing is bringing the flavor of the subject the enthusiasm for the subject to the students. You're not going to tell them every piece of information, you just can't. When you make a handout, or if you're posting notes on the web for your class, I think it's a good idea to not make them complete. Leave some open space there for the students to discover. And I don't know how many people are, are using uh, paper handouts anymore, but it is an effective way to have an outline of a lecture and then have things missing so that you can have a reasonable pace, the students have some of the material written down in front of them, and then they can fill in the blanks. And I've seen that used effectively not only by me, but also by many others. Okay, so the fourth, fourth uh, tip is to get participation. Again, we heard this from the uh, previous presenter as well. And um, I'm going to use an example of how I get participation in my 100 level class because I'm going to have you all participate. So does everyone have a piece of toilet paper? Is there any left, any extra toilet paper in the back? Yeah, yeah, oh, there is. Does everybody have a piece? Do you have a piece? Yeah, okay. So um, what I'm going to talk about, and I do this in my class, so this is an example of participation is I'm going to talk about uh, first in my class, we've of course, we're studying microbiology, and we are talking about, one of the things that we talk about is the size of microbial cells. So the average bacterial cell is one micron in diameter, and I have a, a visual here for everybody to look at. I want you to look at it and then pass it around. So what this is, is a baggie um, that has 1,000 pieces of rice in it. And I had a very exciting evening last night preparing for this lecture because I counted out four bags with 1,000 pieces of rice. And then there is a Xerox of a ruler. And for your students who may or may not know, and for you who may or may not know immediately what a micron is, there are 1,000 microns between the smallest division on the metric side of the ruler. So there are 1,000 microns 
for every millimeter. A micron is one millionth of a meter. Okay, so this visual uh, is something I think most people can see right away. We've got the ruler. I've got the, in between the smallest divisions on the metric side, I say 1,000 bacteria. Because if the bacteria are one micron in diameter, then, oh, did you see? I did. You did. Okay. Uh, uh, then you could line them up end to end, 1,000 1, of them in that tiny little space. Okay, so that's the information in the microbiology class that the students have. And here's how you get participation. I want all of you to take your piece of toilet paper and I want you to hold it up to the light. Now let's, granted this is University of Idaho quality toilet paper, maybe not the best on the market. I want you to look up at the light and I want you to a answer the question, could a single bacterial cell move through that toilet paper? Yes. I mean, no question. Now, unless you're on a really strict budget, I don't think anybody uses toilet paper just one ply, right? I mean, when we, and this is what I want you to be thinking about, obviously. When do we really use toilet paper? We're in the restroom, and if you're having a stool, you are pooping out billions of bacterial cells. Some of them can cause disease. Okay, so fold up your toilet paper as if you're going to use it in the restroom, hold it up to the light, Think about the size of a bacterial cell and again, answer the question, could bacteria move through this piece of toilet paper? You better be saying yes, and I hope you're all thinking, oh my gosh, I definitely have to wash my hands after I use the restroom. And of course, that's the point. That is the point. I think I have all of your attention, and so you can see this teaching method you get a little bit of participation. I mean, a few seconds of participation. You rip off some toilet paper, but you have everyone's attention. And so you get a little bit of participation and then you have a teaching moment. So it's very important to wash your hands because even if you use toilet paper, you have fecal bacteria on your hands. They can contaminate food if you handle food. They can be transferred to other people if you touch fomites or objects when you go exit the bathroom if you haven't washed your hands. Obviously now fecal bacteria are on the door of the restroom and that's why it would be better to just push your way out of the restroom if it's a swinging door or stand in there until somebody else opens the door so you can get out. Okay, well that's kind of crazy, but the idea is get participation. Okay, if this lecture was a course, I would be trying to get participation by getting you to build an acronym to remember the 17 teaching methods I'm going to talk about. So does everybody know what an acronym is? You're taking a single letter that then reminds you of a word or an activity and you're putting the single letters together and you're building a phrase so that you can remember what you learned. And so I want you all to do that today. So you should take out a pen and paper or pencil and something or a knife and etch it onto the the uh, wooden, uh, pla well, maybe we better not do that. And now it's on tape, oh, I'm gonna be fired. Okay, so we're gonna build an acronym to remember these 17 methods. So I'm not gonna use obvious letters because I want it to spell something at the end, I guess. So for enthusiasm, so this is what I've told you so far. Be enthusiastic, expect excellence, let the students do the work and get participation. So for enthusiasm, I want you to use the H for excellence, the E for students, the T, and for participation, the A. So you have three letters so far, H, E, T, and A. So what I want you to be doing is thinking, what does this spell? Well, you know you can have a the there, and you have a heat, and maybe you have eight. Just be thinking about it, and you have at and he. So think about what you can spell with these letters, and in the end, um, we'll have a phrase. Okay, so number five, be rigorously prepared and your letter for your acronym is an A. There is nothing like knowing your subject, absolutely nothing, and your students will respect it and they will love you for the knowledge that you have. So you absolutely need to know the material you're going to present. If you're going to use a word when you're giving your TA presentation and you're not positive of the definition of that word, you need to prepare 
before you use that word so that you know the definition in case a student asks. When you teach, you should regularly incorporate new material. I've been teaching a microbiology 100 level class since 1990. And you know, the reality is there's not that much new material that I would necessarily need to bring to the classroom, but I do. I read the breakthroughs even in, in microbiology at, at very high levels and try to bring that into the classroom. If there's something new about AIDS, I bring it into the classroom. If there's something new about cloning a gene, I bring it into the classroom. And these little snippets of new information or new material from year to year keep the lecture fresh, I think. You want to organize your TA presentations. Don't just think that you can walk in and wing it. You can't. No one really can. Even for this presentation, I prepared. I prepared for more than an hour yesterday, thinking about how I was going to tell you these tips, even though my lecture had been written for several years. So the best, always prepare. It takes a lot of time to be ready to go into the classroom and really tell your students in an organized way what, you have to, what they have to do. How, how many of you are TAing a laboratory setting? So, so many of you are, and you know in the lab, the students want to just get to the bench. They want to just get their hands on the stuff and start doing the work. So you have a very short amount of time to introduce the subject, tell them what to do, so you have to be prepared so that it will run smoothly. Likewise, if you're giving lectures. The other thing I think is important is to arrive early. And I think that you all saw that I did that today. I hope that, and I think what that shows is you have great respect for the activity. Now, truth be told, the most important work I think I do at the university is my research in my laboratory where I study E. coli 0157. It causes diarrhea, which is why I'm obsessed with toilet paper. Um, so that's what I think is most important. It is certainly not most visible. What's most visible is my teaching. I think teaching is important, but personally, my research is more important to me. But I never want the students to feel that way. And if I rush into the lecture hall the very last second or two minutes late, you know, thinking about my research and not really thinking about the fact that I'm going to teach and then having to kind of regroup in front of them, this sends a bad message. If you come early, I think it shows respect. It shows that you are ready to teach. You feel that it's important. The other thing that happens is you will have students in your lectures or in your laboratory who are afraid to approach you after the lecture starts maybe and then they're busy to go to another class. If you're there early, you can go up and just say, hey, you know, how are you? What's your major? Oh, you're taking this class. That's great. Sometimes that will lead to, you know, I have a question on page 12. And so it, it sets a very nice atmosphere to be early. Okay, be rigorously prepared. There's your A. Number six, tell the students who you are. And here's your letter. It's in yellow. Use an O to build your acronym. You want to tell them who you are because it's part of the personal interaction. It's part of letting them know who, for in my case, who's a microbiologist? Who would devote their life to studying diarrhea? So I want to tell them who I am. I tell them funny things, personal things that I'm willing to share. I don't do it necessarily all at once, but throughout the lecture, throughout the semester, I would give this information. I tell them, where I grew up, you know, why am I studying this subject? What are your credentials? So here I've told you some of my credentials. Um, and, and why are you at their school being their teacher or their TA? So um, if this lecture was a course, I would be telling you, and you probably already know from my accent, I grew up in Chicago, Illinois. I was born there, and I still have that accent even though I moved away when I was 17. I can't get rid of that accent. You know, I'm from the Midwest. End of story. And I grew up in Chicago. Why did I major in microbiology? Well, it's because of two people, Sheila, who was a girl who lived on my dorm floor when I was a freshman, and Dr. Sam Kaplan. So I was interested in either studying biology or studying political science. I was at the university in the 70s, the mid-70s, 
when you know Vietnam and the end of Vietnam and you know we didn't trust anybody over 30 and we're taking over the streets and you know political science was the thing I'm not sure what I thought I was going to do with it but I was interested in biology and political science biology seemed something I could get a job in and one day Sheila came onto the floor in my dorm and she goes oh I just heard about a new class. It's called microbiology. I said, microbiology, what is that? She goes, well, I don't know, but I think we need to know less material than biology. And I said, oh, <laughs> that sounds good, let's sign up. So I took my first microbiology class as a sophomore, and my teacher was Sam Kaplan, and he was fabulous. He expected unbelievable excellence. He knew the subject backwards and forward. He made it so fun, he was so scary. You know, back in the day, he would be lecturing, be like 300 kids. It was at the University of Illinois. 300 kids in the lecture room, and he would just say, what's the second enzyme to the Krebs cycle? And you would be just like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And he would just focus on you, everybody, until you could say that enzyme. And if you didn't know, oh my gosh, you better, you went home and studied it. Anyway, it was very fun, and, he, and that is why I went on to study microbiology. If this lecture was a course, I would be telling you that I got my bachelor's at the University of Illinois. I went on to study at Swedish Hospital in Seattle, and I became a med tech. I worked as a med tech for five years. And then I went back to school at the University of Minnesota to get a, my PhD. Then I did a postdoc at Harvard. And um, those are my credentials, essentially. Then I found a job here at the uh, the University of Idaho. And the reason that I'm, why did I move to Moscow, Idaho, is because my, my fiance, uh, my husband now, um, found a job here. He's also a microbiologist. He studies um, Staph aureus, which makes you throw up. And then I study E. coli that gives you diarrhea, so we're a really dynamic couple. Anyway, he got a job here, and that's why I moved here. And of course, why did I stay here? I think these pictures are worth 10,000 words, if not more. Um, why are we all in Idaho? It's the best place on the planet. Look at it. OK, number seven, create a level playing field in your classroom. And that's the F. You know, my parents kind of raised me that, to think, oh, you know, life is fair. You work hard. Good things are going to happen. I mean, is that our experience? You know, it isn't my experience. Life is not fair. Life is not fair. We see it all over. Some people are lucky. Some people are not lucky. Some people have good things happen to them they don't seem to deserve. Some people have very bad things that happen to them. Of course, they don't deserve. So life is not fair. But you can make your classroom as fair as possible. You make it a level playing field. So when students come in through the door to take your class, they know exactly what it's going to be exactly for the whole semester. The way you do that is you make a contract with the students and you do not change the specifics. Very few professors actually adhere to this, but I think it's critical. So you have a syllabus that tells them exactly what's going to happen in the class. You have nothing outside of that syllabus that, uh, that's offered either formally or informally. Why is that unfair? I mean, a lot of students say, I want to review, and I want to review on Thursday night. I want to come on Saturday and, and have a formal review because it's easy for me. If you have vocal students requesting that, you have students who are quiet and they have a family, or they have duties to take care of children, or they have a job, and they can't come on Thursday night. They can't come on Saturday. But they're not going to say out in front of everybody else, no, I can't come, so it's not fair. They're just going to sit there and say, well, I guess I have to miss that. You don't want that. And if you look at the university regulations, they will say the only time you can meet is your scheduled class time because the university is making a contract as well. On day one, you want to set the time, the day, and the place for every exam. Again, you don't change this. If you are behind in the material, then you tell the students that material won't be covered on this exam because I didn't go over it. 
But to change the exam because students in the class are asking or you've been slow, again, it's unfair. It's unfair to the silent student. You want to give detail about the exam format so they know what's coming. And you specify very clearly how they earn the grade. You know, we want the students to be interested in the subject. And I want my students to go home and read microbiology almost exclusively because it is the most important subject. But you know that is not the reality, right? I mean, many kids in your class are just there to pass. They're maybe not interested in the subject. They need credits. They want to get a grade. That's what they're there for. They want to have it on their transcript that they took this class and they have the credits and they have the grade. So you have to tell them exactly how to do that. Along the way, I think that you can build their enthusiasm. Okay, if this lecture was a course, um, I would have a syllabus that would tell you I'm talking about teaching methods and that I'm going to talk about them for about 40 minutes. I would have an assignment and that's to build the acronym, which I have. And I'm telling you that the assignment is going to be due at the end of the lecture and those are your letters so far. So you should be working on your acronym. Build some words out of these letters, a phrase. It's going to be a phrase in the end, okay? Number eight, less is more. This was a hard lesson for me to learn. The very first years that I taught, I just came into the lecture room and I was like a racehorse. I was just like, woo, woo, there's this and that and this and this and this you need to know. And I was just dumping data. That's not the point. It's so much better to cover less material, but get the students interested so they go home and read because that's when they learn. They don't really learn anything sitting in the classroom. They learn when they think about your lecture later on and put it in the context of their life and, um, or read material and think about it, uh, it after you've enlightened them about some things. Number nine, minimize the technology. And here your letter is an H. You can see it written there in yellow. Minimize the technology. I learned this from a fabulous microbiologist, Stan Malloy. Stan Malloy came and gave a seminar in the microbiology department, oh, it's maybe, maybe about eight or nine years ago now. And we were very excited to have him because he's internationally famous. And we got the room all ready and we had an overhead projector and we had the slides ready uh, you know, to put, it, put his uh, PowerPoint presentation in. And we, when he came into the lecture room, we said, OK, we have everything ready. Do you have overheads? Do you have handouts? Do you have, what do you have? And everything's ready. He goes, well, thank you very much. And then, and then he pushed aside the overhead projector, and he pushed aside the podium that gave slides. And he picked up, he raised the screen. He picked up a piece of chalk, and he talked to us. It was the best seminar I ever heard. The pace was right. He was writing so we could take notes. And it, it was just so well done, and there was no technology. So I, although this is not popular, I think it's better to talk to your students rather than snow them with the technology. Number 10, when you use technology, I would tell you you should really make it count. Because obviously, I do use technology. I'm not up here with a piece of chalk, because I couldn't go through it fast enough. And here your letter is an M for building that acronym. So I told you that my research is about E. coli 0157H7. It's the jack-in-the-box strain that causes bloody diarrhea. And cattle carry this particular strain of E. coli in their GI tract, and they are not sick. So they have no diarrhea. We all carry E. coli, but we don't carry 0157, that particular serotype. So Healthy cattle, though, are the, are the silent reservoir. So how do you get this kind of diarrhea? It's under, undercooked hamburger, undercooked ground beef, um, unpasteurized dairy products, handling cattle um, are some of the major ways. And when spinach or vegetable is the food source that's contaminated with E. coli 0157, and when we can trace the bacterial source in the spinach or lettuce or tomatoes, when we can trace the source, it almost always leads back to cattle. So there's been runoff in heavy rains, or there's contamination with fecal material from cattle. Okay? So um, 
my lab has done a lot of experiments. We found out the attachment site in the cattle GI tract. It turns out to be at the very end of the uh, animal. And um, so what I'm telling you is cattle carry E. coli 0157 in their GI tract. And where they carry it is really weird. They carry it at the rectoanal junction. So what do those words mean? Recto, anal, junction. So there's a mucosal, little ring of mucosal tissue at the very end of the cattle's butt. And very weird, this is where E. coli 0157 colonizes. So colonizes means the bacteria actually attach to the mucosal membrane of the animal at that place. We have E. coli all along our colon, and cattle have E. coli all along their colon, but where 0157H7 attaches is the rectoanal junction. Okay, so I could go through all the experiments, tell you all about this, I could show you graphs and blah, 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 but I think this is more effective because you will remember, okay? E. coli 0157H7 colonizes the bovine rectoanal junction mucosa. This is a picture that is so rude. I don't know how many people have experience with cattle in this room. They poop out 50, 50 pounds of poop a day. I mean, these are, they're pooping a lot. So this picture was easy to get. And although the picture is rude, I think it's memorable. So here's an example of using technology in a way that's effective. Rather than have millions of, of slides or movies or whatever, I think you'll remember that. Okay, number 11. Give specific study tips. Your letter is a T. And I would say these specific tips don't mince words. If your students are saying, oh, this is so much material, what do I need to know? You're not going to tell them, oh, just read it over, you'll be okay, the exam's not that hard, if that's not true. If they need to memorize glycolysis, you need to tell them straight away. And you need to tell them that the only way to understand glycolysis and answer the questions is to memorize it. It's a boring activity and you need to memorize it. It's not something you're gonna figure out on the exam. You need to tell them, for every hour in the lecture room, you should be studying three hours. It's amazing how many students don't think that. They think they come to class, and then the day before the test, they look over the material while they're sitting in the student union building, and then they come in and they do poorly on your exam. So you want to lay out for them what, what specific activities are you thinking that they're, you're do, they're doing. I think it's really good to use stories when you can. Let's see. And so I'm going to use a story about my uncle. So my uncle Fred uh, is probably the most famous person in our family. And maybe all of you also have some link to a famous person. Maybe somebody in Hollywood. Maybe, maybe some person who is very successful in your family. Well, for our family, my uncle Fred was the guy. So he, he's passed away now, but he was a Rhodes Scholar. He was chief of US rocket ordnance research in World War II. He was the president of Purdue University in Indiana for a long time, from 46 to 71. It was a time when upper administrative people didn't move around the way they do now. So he was really, his name was very linked to Purdue and he was instrumental in building that university. And in fact, the administration building on the Purdue campus in West Lafayette is named after him. It's Hovde Hall and my maiden name is Hovde. So if you're ever at Purdue, uh, maybe you can think of my uncle Fred. That's what he looked like. So um, he, um, he was an undergraduate at the University of Minnesota way back 1925 to 29. So he was a Rhodes Scholar, he was athletic. In fact, he was the quarterback of the football team at the University of Minnesota when he was a student there. And back in the day, if you were athletic, you did everything. So in the winter, he was the captain of the basketball team and in the spring, he ran track. I mean, unbelievable. I don't think that that really happens now. It seems that if you're a football star, you know, there you are. You're not on the basketball court. But back in the day, he was doing all of that. His major was chemical engineering, very smart guy. He was in a fraternity. He had a girlfriend who ended up being my aunt, Priscilla. I mean, he's busy. He is busy. 
even though back in the 20s there wasn't so much information to know. Of course, that's a joke. You guys are supposed to laugh. That's a joke. He was busy. I mean, and you all feel like you're busy. And everybody in your classroom is going to feel that they're busy. Well, my Uncle Fred uh, passed away, and my grandparents passed away, his parents. And I inherited some boxes of memorabilia from my grandma that were in her attic. And I kind of sorted through them to see, do I want to keep anything? And one of the things I found was a student newspaper from the University of Minnesota when my uncle was quarterback. And they were interviewing him. A student was interviewing him for the student newspaper. And the student said, how, you're so busy, Fred. How do you do everything? How are you getting good grades in chemical engineering? And his answer, I wish I had read when I was an undergrad, because I looked at this box when I was already a professor here. Guess what he said? He said, I use every minute. So when I'm in the classroom, I try to learn the material as the professor is giving it to me. What an astounding thought. I never did that when I was an undergrad. When I was an undergrad, I had my coffee. I would come in the lecture room. I'd look for my boyfriend. Or I'd look for some other guy that I thought was cute. And I'd try to sit next to them. And I'd see my girlfriend. And so find, you know, I, I was taking notes, but I certainly was not trying to learn the material. I was not using the time. You can tell your students to use the time. And I call this the Uncle Fred method of learning. And I remind my students when I think that they're not really you know, like engaged in the lecture, say, use the Uncle Fred method. What did I just tell you? Do you know those words? Do you know those definitions? Use the time. OK? Try to learn the material as the teacher is lecturing. OK, if this lecture was a course, use the Uncle Fred method to do some in-class learning, I want you to make this acronym. That's what I'm telling you to do. And I hope that this lecture is kind of a demonstration. You can kind of see each one of these things. So here's your letters, if you have them, H-E-T-A-A-O-F-E-H-M-T. -E -E They're going to spell something good. So try to put it together. Number 12, hear it, write it, say it. Every way that you can help your students learn the material, you want them to do it. And now I think a lot of people know what kind of learners they are. I never knew what kind of learner I was actually until about three years ago. Can you believe it? I mean, I'm almost dead. And I finally figured out how I learn. I cannot learn anything orally. If somebody just says it to me, it doesn't go in. It's I need to write it, and then I need to say it. And you might have students that way, obviously, in your class. There are going to be some of them. So you want to give them every way to learn. You tell your students to hear it. They should come to the lecture in the lab and listen to you say it. You want to tell them to write it. If they're not actually taking notes, which many students don't do, you know, tell them to be typing or tell them to be doing something with their hands. Try to be active note takers in lecture and lab. Say it. I tell my students to tell their mom or their roommate or their friends whatever they learned. And I hope from today that at least you'll be at some fancy cocktail party and you're going to say, oh my gosh, I had a TA training session and they handed out toilet paper. Okay, tell, the, tell them why was it and what's the size of a bacterial cell and can it go through the toilet paper. Tell them what you learned. Number 13, give specific pointers for learning the vocabulary. So in whatever your discipline is, you think about the words that might give students problems. So when I taught immunology, um, I had to use the word leukocyte and lymphocyte a lot. These are very different, have different meanings. Some of you probably know. A leukocyte is white blood cell, a whole bunch of different white blood cells. But lymphocytes are one specific kind of white blood cell. If you're just lecturing leukocytes, lymphocytes, and of course I know what I mean when I say leukocyte and lymphocyte, but to the student those words sound similar. And so while you're lecturing, you want to point it out. You want to remind them. Remember, leukocytes are all the white blood cells and lymphocytes are a subset. Again, words like antigen and antibody. They would be easy for your students to mix up if you're throwing them out there fast. So think about your subject and give specific pointers about learning vocabulary. Number 14, give reasons to learn the material. And that's an R. 
and for your acronym. And if you can make it funny, it always helps. Everybody loves to laugh. And so if you can give them a reason to laugh, usually this, this helps. And if you don't have a funny story of your own, you know, you can gather them from other people. And so I'm going to tell you that in my lecture, one of the things that I have my students learn are, are the definitions of the word eukaryotic and prokaryotic. Does anybody know those definitions? Do you know the difference between those cells? OK, you do. So a prokaryotic cell is a bacterial cell. It doesn't have a nucleus. It doesn't have any organelles. It's very complex, but it's not suborganized. A eukaryotic cell are all the plant and animal cells, all our cells. They have a nucleus. They have all these things I want the students to learn. And you know, they don't want to learn it. They're like, you know, it's a 100 level class and they're not science majors. And I want them to know the difference between a eukaryote and a prokaryote because it's so basic to biology. And I think if you have a bachelor's degree, you need to know these words. So how, what do I, how do I tell them how, and, they, and sometimes they'll just say, you know, well, I'm never going to use that. And I go, ah, not true. You will use it. Of course, you'll use it to get a grade in my class, but, you're all, but I know a story where you are going to use it, and I have it. And it's about a, um, a famous microbiologist who was on the East Coast, and he was flying from the East Coast to uh, a meeting in Arizona. So he took the airplane in the winter from Boston to uh, landed in um, Phoenix. But the meeting was in Tucson, so I don't know how many people know Arizona. You know, you got to drive between those two cities. So he rented a car. Beautiful weather, even though it was the winter, sunshine, warm weather. He got a convertible car at the rental place. It was red. And I don't know if any of you have driven between Tucson and, and Phoenix. I mean, it's a gorgeous freeway. I mean, nothing like Boston, right? It's a wide open, flat, wonderful road. And on that morning, it wasn't crowded. Beautiful sunshine, he's in a convertible, and his foot is going down on that gas pedal. But he's late, and he's worried, because he's keynote speaker at the meeting in Tucson, and his flight was a little delayed. It's gorgeous weather, and he's got to get there. He's thinking about his lecture, or his seminar, or the talk he's going to give. And he's going, and all of a sudden, he hears in the rear view mirror, or sees in the rear view mirror, lights flashing and he hears a siren and he goes oh my gosh sure enough it's a state trooper pulls him over the state trooper gets out and and walks up to the car and he says buddy where in the heck are you going do you know how fast you were going and he goes oh officer i'm really sorry you are going 95 miles an hour what are you thinking and, and so my friend said, well, I'm so sorry, officer, but I'm a microbiologist. I'm on my way to the American Society for Microbiology meeting, and I've got to give a talk. And my flight was late. It's gorgeous weather. And I didn't realize how fast I was going. I am so sorry that I was speeding. And the officer put his hands on his hips. He goes, hmm, well, I went to community college, and I took a microbiology class. What's the difference between a eukaryote and a prokaryote? Of course, my friend knew the answer right away. So you never know when a state trooper might want you to be able to define those words. OK, so there is an example of, I think it's kind of a cute little funny story. I could tell I had your attention to hear the end of the joke. And it helps to just bring brevity to the classroom when you're asking your students to learn something. OK, so there is, that's what it was, the difference between a eukaryote and prokaryote. And how could you use this in everyday life? That's the story. If this lecture was a course, there would be a reason to do the work. There would be a reason for you to build that acronym, of course, or to do whatever it was in the course that you're telling them to do, learn the material. And of course, in the, cl in the class, the reason is to get the grade to do good on an exam. And I'm not going to give you a test. I'm asking you to build this acronym. What's in it for you? Well, I hope you'll learn something. But I'm going to give prizes for the best acronym. So if you're not building it yet, you should build it. And look what you can win. Ribbon candy. There will be three prizes. You can get barley soup. I, I thought I'd stay with the like eating 
eating theme. Somebody almost won this by mistake. This is chocolate. I know the women will really want this. It's actually a golden reindeer. Okay, so if you're one of the best acronyms, you can come up and choose your prize. We'll get the toilet paper out of the way. Oh, did that come off of me? No. Okay. Number 15. Use experiments or creative activity, in, if it's in your discipline, to make a point. And that's a T for your acronym. And you want to build a story and ask a question. This is very typical in science, where you build the, t say, the hypothesis. Then you say, how would you test for the hypothesis? Then you build the experiment. And then you make the point. And when I taught immunology, that is um, how I taught it. We just talked about. His, each experiment that would lead to a particular conclusion. And I think it was a very effective way, rather than just say, B cells make antibody. That's kind of boring. But if you show the experiment where they deleted the B cells and then they looked in the serum to see whether or not there were antibodies, that's much more interesting. So I think that you can see if you can use an experiment or creative activity to make a point, it's good. You want to show and discuss the details of the experiment or whatever the creative activity is. But you always bring your students back to the big picture. So you don't just stay in talking about this experiment with mice where they deleted the B cells and then they found out they made antibody. You come back and you say B cells make antibody. That's the conclusion. OK. OK. Number 16, engage in your discipline or your creative activity, in my case, is research. I think it's so important to be actively doing whatever it is you're teaching. And you know, this is the great difference between coming to a university or being in um, a, a community college or small liberal arts school, usually. And this is something you can tell your students. You know, the advantage of being in the university is your teachers are doing the work that they're teaching about. And I think that for me, research, as I said, is the most important thing that I do personally. It's because it helps me think critically. It renews my curiosity in microbiology. It, it helps me reason very methodically. It helps me express concepts precisely because that's what you have to do to write an effective grant, to publish a manuscript. You have to be doing the activities that make you a fabulous teacher. You're doing them in your creative activity or your research. And it also lets you show your students in, in the best way possible that you love your subject. You love the subject you're teaching because you're doing it. And so you want to share with them that you are actually in the international arena of doing your subject material. OK, oh my gosh, we got to the last one, right? There's 17 of them. Number 17, create repetition. And that's an E, so now you have all the letters to build a, a little phrase. And I'm going to talk about repetition uh, with a professor, a really a long time ago professor. He actually was a professor when my uncle Fred was at the University of Minnesota. And the students called him Racehorse Hennessy. Now, I've built in a lot of repetition be in this uh, short talk because I told you again and again what are the 17 points. So the repetition is built in there. But this guy, Racehorse Hennessy, he was the extreme, 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 extreme of repetition. And I always think the year before I retire, I'm going to do this technique. I'm too afraid to do it now. I think I would be fired, lose my job. But this is what Racehorse Hennessy did. He taught calculus. And back in the day, you know, you didn't ever question the professor. So students had the textbook. And there were 25 chapters in the textbook. And he started off, he did three chapters every time every week or something. And so they came to, and back in the day, you had a midterm and a final. The midterm covered every single chapter in the calculus book. And the students you know, were dying because it was so fast. They had to learn so much material. They took the midterm, and they're thinking, you know, back in the day, there was no syllabus. What is he going to do after midterm? Because we've already done the book. So they came after midterm, and I know you know it's ha going to happen. He said, open your textbook to chapter one. And he went through the chapters again. 
And my dad and my uncle both took his class and they said that was the way to learn calculus. And maybe some of you are experiencing this in graduate school. I know it happened to me. You know, I had great grades as an undergrad. I took a lot of microbiology classes. But I didn't really learn the material till I was a grad student. I saw it again. I saw it again, really from the beginning at a higher level. But I saw the microbiology again. And I could finally incorporate it. And I think into my psyche. And I think that that's what happens with repetition. So if you can build repetition in to your uh, class, you should. OK, here's the summary. This is what I told you today, 17 tips. Be enthusiastic, expect excellence. Have the students do the work, get participation from the students, be rigorously prepared, tell your students about you, create a level playing field in the classroom, less is more, minimize the technology, but when you use the technology, make it count. And of course, you can see these letters, the letters are in um, yellow for making your little phrase if you're going to try to do it. Number 11, give specific study tips. Hear it, write it, say it. All of the material you're going to give them, give it to them in all of those forms and encourage them to say it because they might be learners that can only learn when they speak it. Give specific vocabulary tips. Give a reason for them to learn the material. Use experiments or creative activity uh, when you give examples. Be engaged in your subject. For me, it's research. And create repetition when you teach. OK, I can see that some of you are working on this, making this acronym and finding the words, making the letters, or make, using those letters to make the words. So, um, so that's what it is. Any, here's the letters. Does anybody have an acronym they want to share? Yeah? Teach from the heart. Fabulous. Does anybody else have an acronym or that one? Yeah? Father cheat mother. Father cheat mother. <laughs> Woohoo! Okay, that's got Oedipus complex or something in it. No, maybe not. That's okay. If it helps you remember it, father cheat mother. I didn't know that was in there. Teach from the heart was the one I had, yeah? Match of the heart. Woo! I like that one too. So you three can come down and collect a prize. I hope that there's something there you want to eat, either chocolate or candy or, you know, and you can re-gift it too if the gifts are not fancy enough for you. So for me, uh, the acronym was Teach from the Heart. And you know, if you bring yourself into the laboratory or lecture hall, your students will love you. They're coming. They want to love you. They want to love their teacher. And so uh, good luck if this is the first time you're teaching. I hope it's a lot of fun. OK, any questions? I'm happy to answer them. You survived it. Look at you. Good. OK, thanks.